Hi, everyone, and welcome to our RareX Facebook Live for the Home Assistant Area Data Collection Program. My name is Danae Barkey, and I am the Executive Director and a, patient, a classical Home Assistant Area patient. Um, I am joined here today by Pamela Penrose and Dana Hunt, and uh, they'll be shortly introducing themselves. Um, but today we will be talking about how Home Assistant Area um, diagnosis impacts our quality of life. And so um, I'm going to quickly give an update here and share where, how many patients have enrolled um, since our, our last uh, Facebook Live event two weeks ago. And so I have a quick slide to share here. We now have 18 uh, patients enrolled in the data collection program for home assisted neuria. And we have a graph here, um, about half of them are from the United States. And then you can also see on the graph that um, next in line is Canada, um, whoops, and then followed by the United Kingdom. But the data collection program really is a global effort. So if you don't see your country on here, that means that you haven't started the form. And if you have, and you don't see your country, please let us know. Um, next, it's broken down by state since the US is the most utilized here so far. And right now um, it's kind of a tie between Illinois, Florida, and uh, Colorado. And so we are so excited by these numbers. Um, we still need quite a few more families though to have really good data for our conference in June. So if you have not joined yet, please do so. Um, we are going to now um, introduce ourselves um, and, re and I'll recap my why. Um, so my why for participating in the data collection program is when we were diagnosed, um, in 1995, my brother and I were told that the average lifespan of patients was 30 years old. And being a 10 year old, 30 may have seemed really old at <laughs> the time, but we knew it wasn't that long. And so it's very frightening. Um, and now as an adult, well into my thirties, there's not a lot of data to kind of back up what happens next in our experience. And, you know, connect the dots as to, is this home assistant or is this just part of regular aging. And so I'm hoping that the data collection program can kind of answer some of those questions. Um, Dana, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. My name is Dana Hunt and my son Carson is currently 14 years old. He was misdiagnosed because he was caught on the newborn screen when he was born in 2007. And after three months, they said that he could possibly not even survive, let alone have a life that was worth any quality. And here we are 14 years later, and we could not be more thrilled the fact that there is actually a community out there for us to be able to come together, share our information, share our doctors, get researchers on board. So our why is to, for me, to like, I'd love to advocate for everybody to go in, take the time, fill out, participate in this wonderful effort for us to collect who we are, see us as a global community, not just a community of one. And as Carson's heading into adolescence, there isn't any research as to the why things are happening to him and how long things are going to happen. But they were wrong 14 years ago when they said he wasn't going to live past three months. And we'd love to continue in that effort and help others give others hope for the future as well. Excellent. Um, Pam, would you like to introduce Hi. yourself? Hi, I'm Pam Penrose. I live in uh, Carson City, Nevada. Uh, I am a patient with uh, classical homocystinuria. I, as well as Danae said, I was a very late diagnosis. I wasn't diagnosed until I was 54 after I uh, had uh, experienced a stroke and also uh, two hospitalizations with multiple blood clots. And I started looking around online and um, doing some research myself and basically found out about homocystinuria online and then was later diagnosed at Stanford Hospital in California. 
So um, my why is um, kind of twofold. I, I think it's very important for patients to share their stories. I think the more uh, researchers and doctors can hear our stories and hear our experiences, because every patient is different with their stories, um, I think that they can, uh, they can um, develop better therapies and treatments for us the more they know about what our experiences have been. Uh, also, like Danae said, uh, I'm going to be 65 in July, and I've way outlived the lifespan that was originally um, told for people with homocystinuria. As Danae said, it was generally around 30. Well, I wasn't even diagnosed till I was 54, so I have a lot of questions about what's going to happen to me as well as far as aging. And um, those are some of the things that I'd like to see answered through um, this uh, Rare X program. Wonderful. So homocystinuria, there are so many different types. And, you know, depending on if we were diagnosed through newborn screening or if we were diagnosed late, as in the case, really, for a true diagnosis between all three of us, uh, <laughs> you know, our quality of lives are definitely impacted differently. Even those who have, were diagnosed through newborn screening, their quality of life is impacted. We all just experience it in different ways, depending on, um, you know, how we handle the diagnosis and also how um, the symptoms that we present with. So today we're gonna to talk kind of in three categories. We'll talk about quality of life and how it impacts us physically. Um, then we'll dive into how it uh, impacts us uh, mentally and socially. And then we'll kind of close with the financial impact as well. Um, all play a significant role in our quality of life. Um, and so one of the things that we all discussed beforehand is the impact that homocystinuria has on the eyes and the role um, that plays on our quality of life. Um, I'm going to kind of go first just because I'm already talking here, but, uh, the quality of life, I, in 2011, I had eye surgery that corrected my vision, which still to this day seems like really a small miracle, not a small miracle, a very large miracle. Um, still wake up waiting for like my vision to be bad again. Um, but I now have 20, 20 vision, but prior to that, um, my vision was terrible. Um, and I started to lose my uh, independence and ability to drive. Um, and it was scary. Um, I, especially at night, um, I, the only way I could explain it is like night blindness. Nothing was clear. The lights just seemed amplified. Um, and it caused a lot of anxiety. And so for me, my vision was a huge, huge problem. Um, as it is with so many patients. Um, and I couldn't keep up with the constant changes every single month. I was at the ophthalmologist getting new glasses and getting new contacts and trying to find out a solution that led me to kind of seeing clearly, but nothing was ever working. And, you know, all these things kind of feed into the other points we'll be discussing later on, but insurance only covers one pair of glasses a year. Insurance also only covers one visit. And so when you're <laughs> going to the ophthalmologist, they're like, well, we just gave you a new pair of glasses. We gave you new contacts. Why are you going again? Um, and it, it made things really frustrating. So um, I, that that's just one of the many physical things, um, but I'll, Pam and um, Dana can talk about their experiences with the quality of life also that uh, their, their, the vision problems have caused. Um, As a parent for Carson, they had originally told us that his vision loss would be progressive and he's considered legally blind because he doesn't actually have any retinas in either of his eyes. He only has peripheral vision. But they thought that as the homocysteinuria CBLG began to increase and he began to grow, that he was most likely he was going to be completely blind. So as a parent living with that, waiting for, as I always refer to it as, when you look at the list, when you get on Google and you see what we're all up against, it's just, it's overwhelming. And the anxiety and the depression 
and not knowing where to go or turn, especially the fact that we have a community now, but 14 years ago, there wasn't. He was a solo party of one at that particular point. So they um, think knowing in your back of your mind that something is progressive and watching your child try is, is, is awful. At the same time, when teachers and caregivers and professionals are just like, you know what, he's not going to see, he's not going to talk. Completely a trial and error of finding someone who believes in what you believe in is just not giving up on them. And that's where we were at with Carson. When they said he wasn't going to read, he wasn't going to see, he's not going to talk, he's not going to walk. We just had to keep knocking down the doors of who was actually going to take an interest in the fact that we need to at least try. So our journey for him, he doesn't know that side because we have decided to try and live our lives to the fullest, not letting this define him. This doesn't define him. This is just part of his journey. And so that when we finally adopted that philosophy, like we're just not going to give up until, until we just physically can no longer go for it, then that's how we've done it. So he now is at a stage when he's turning as a teenager, where now he's recognizing the fact that there are some things that mom can't just, we can't as parents, we can't fix. One of them that we're coming up against is the driving. Um, because he is legally blind and he doesn't have deaf perception, he will not be able to pass a driver's test and see that far. So when that, that's, but every stage, I believe, of this journey has so many different obstacles. It's just a constant changing, sort of like when they age. Every age has its own obstacles. And I kind of feel that that is exactly what's happened with this journey. So we feel so blessed that we can help others who are starting out on this journey when it comes to how to take medi medications and how to navigate certain scenarios. We've been through it, trial and error over and over again. So that's where we're at least feeling hopeful. We're hopeful for the rare acts that someone will take a look at because we're stronger in numbers. So we're hoping that the more we continue to get everybody on board, they'll, that they'll look at us and continue to help us explore uh, options for those of us that are in the teens and in our middle ages, and not just what's happening when they're first born. Um, Pamela, would you like to, to chime in about, you know, I, I know having such a later diagnosis, you know, it unfortunately gave way for more um, presentation and symptoms to, to surface. Sure. Um, would you like to, to share a little bit? Sure. Um, I, the first thing that my parents noticed when I was very young, probably around two years old, was the fact that I was having a lot of trouble with my eyesight. They just noticed that I was holding everything very close to me and, um, you know, I, or I was missing things that, you know, I should have been able to pick up. And uh, so they took me to uh, an optometrist originally. And as soon as the optometrist looked in my eyes, they automatically saw it, I think already by two years old that my lenses had started to dislocate. And th when they saw that, they said, you know, this uh, problem is really way beyond what we're capable of dealing with and you need to find an ophthalmologist. So my parents then took me to an ophthalmologist and um, th they uh, took a look at my eyes and, and agreed that my lenses had started to dislocate. And I started wearing glasses probably from about two or three years old. And um, uh, I can remember that, that wearing the very heavy Coke bottle glasses <laughs> and um, having very, very poor eyesight. I can remember uh, at the time I was in elementary school, we lived maybe 12 blocks from the school. And at that time it was very safe for everybody to walk to school. And my mom always had my brother walk with me and he, she never let me walk by myself because she was so afraid that I was gonna get hit by a car or whatever because I just didn't have the, the eyesight to see very well at all. And uh, every year when uh, I would start a new grade in elementary school, my mom would always have to go to the, um, to the teachers and talk to them and say, you know, my daughter's got very big problems with her eyesight and she needs to be in the front row and, you know, make sure that uh, she's able to see what she can see. And um, I did need to have some adaptations, things blown up in larger print or 
I remember having a, a magnifying page that I could put on top of uh, books to read and, and some minor, minor things like that. But I was actually feel like I was very lucky in some ways because uh, I was really able to function in school fairly well, despite my <laughs> severe eye problems that I had. And then when I was about uh, close to 12 years old, I, uh, the ophthalmologist that I was going to had a protege that came into, into his office and was working with him. And the ophthalmologist uh, suggested that maybe I should try contact lenses. And at that time, no one was wearing contact lenses at 12 years old. This was in the, the mid sixties. And um, so they decided to try that and it was amazing the difference. I could finally see leaves on trees and I could read street signs and do all kinds of things that I was never able to, to see before. And it was, it was just amazing. And at that time I had, when I got the contacts, I was corrected to, I think at my best 2025 vision. So that was just amazing when I don't, I can't really recall what my vision was before, but it was pretty bad. <laughs> and um, so I, I went along for many years uh, with, with, like I said, after I got the contacts and seeing very well. However, I can, I can also remember times in elementary school and actually in junior high and even in high school, you know, being in PE classes and um, there being sports teams and everybody was being picked for the sports teams and I was always the last one being picked because I just always had terrible hand and eye coordination because of the eye problems that I'd experienced all my life. But um, really, like I said, for the most part, having those contacts, it was a huge change and for the better. And um, then later on, uh, I, I really got along well with my contacts for a long, long time. But now that I'm in my 60s, I'm noticing that I'm starting to have quite a bit of trouble with my eyesight again. And it's really hard for me to tell if it's a problem related to the homocystinuria or if it's just a, a part of aging. You know, truthfully, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, I also have a glaucoma in um, my eyes that I've had for probably about the last four years. And I get a little frustrated sometimes with the doctors that I've been seeing. I live in a small town and, um, you know, I try to get to the best people I can, but they're not always familiar with the ins and outs of homocystinuria, <laughs> definitely. I mean, they, they are able to help a lot with, you know, I would say the general population, but, you know, having a rare disease that kind of throws a different aspect into the mix of things. So um, anyway, uh, I, right now, I, like I said, I do have glaucoma and then I've had retinal detachments uh, that I've had repaired and um, I've had my lenses taken out. So I've had quite a few things that, the, that my eyesight has interfered with. Also, uh, when it was my time to learn to drive at 16, I never felt comfortable, even though I did have my contacts and I was seeing better, but I think just I had grown up all my life not seeing very well and I was always very afraid to drive. And I didn't actually even get my license until I was 22 years old. And I did fine after that, um, and and I did well. But uh, now I'm actually not driving anymore because the peripheral vision uh, in my eyes is going downhill. Seems like fairly rapidly. So um, I'm continuing to work with my ophthalmologist here and seeing what they can do for me. But that's kind of the way it impacted me in my pre my previous and earlier life. So I think we'll, we'll transition here to the mental and social impact because I, I think it's just kind of a, a logical transition um, coming from the vision play, place. Mm -hmm. But um, also, you know, our, I, I know for myself, um, my vision as it was deteriorating so quickly, it definitely caused anxiety and then the fear that came with it of, you know, am I actually going to completely lose my vision? Um, am I going to lose my ability to be independent? It caused also quite a bit of depression too, just because, you know, it, you know what the grass is like on the one side and now it's slowly drifting away. Um, and it's, it's scary. It's, it's incredibly scary. Um, 
And so, you know, I, it definitely has an impact. It also, and Pam mentioned the social aspect in school. Um, you know, no one wants to pick you for a team sport that requires <laughs> eye-hand coordination. I can definitely say I, I experienced that, that, but also, you know, kids are, unfortunately, um, they're, they're not kind. And when you're so, when you when your vision is so impaired, sometimes you become so oblivious to the, to the teasing that exists around you. And you don't realize you're kind of the butt of the joke sometimes, but you don't realize it. It, it, it's an unfortunate fact when you can't see, maybe it's a good thing, a little a bit of ignorance, but it, it, at the same time, no one, no one wants to be to the butt of someone else's joke. Um, and so it, it definitely has an impact. Um, I just was going to kind of note here, you know, for myself, in addition to the vision, the low protein diet has definitely created um, a source of stress and contention just because I think it, you think about society and how we celebrate things and everything is around food, absolutely everything. So trying to do, you know, typical family celebrations, Mother's Day is coming up and uh, trying to plan a menu for Mother's Day. It's, it's nearly impossible. Um, you can't just pick a spot and go out to eat. You have to make sure that, you know, there's actually something on that menu that you can eat. And then you have to kind of plan your day around it just because it's not really probably going to be the best thing, even if you can. Um, I know when I was little, like the idea of a sleepover was, you know, that, that was stressful too, because it meant, you know, planning things in advance, birthday parties, planning things in advance. Um, and so, you know, and you also didn't want people to know <laughs> like that you had these special things. So if you're bringing your special food and your special formula, well, all of a sudden the cat's out of the bag. Um, Dana, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the mental and social mental. side since cobalamin looks a little bit different? It does look a little bit different. It, I was just thinking when you were talking like that, uh, Carson, he struggles so much with the fact that he is different, but it's so hard to understand. Mom, mom, why can't you fix me? What do I need to do to fix this? It's the fix. And to explain that it's this rare genetic disorder and how it works. And it's so complex and how many systems it affects that it's it, when you can, he's not understanding, well, let's just fix my eyes. How can we can't fix my eyes and have a surgery here or have a surgery there like they're doing? And I think that's heartbreaking. And now as he's getting older, he's trying to understand, but it's so complex. And when we talk about things that are happening, especially with at school, socially, you know, the, one of the things with the, 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 the disease is that there is limited, that limited eye function from the brain. And so there's always, like you said, a minute delay. There are things that he does not see. He's very black and white. And so the, that is very difficult in social situations, not staying, keeping up with his peers on the same level, um, especially in grade level. And then wanting to do the same things as his friends. It's just, a, it's a difficult course to navigate and especially in these middle school years. Not wanting to be picked and having not, not able to do the same things as, as, as your friends is just, it's heart, it's heart wrenching but we're trying to help him navigate the fact that he has so many amazing qualities. He brings so many different things to the table and just trying to have him be true to himself. And I think part of the great thing about this is now that he's starting to recognize and own it as our t-shirts are saying, mm -hmm. he's now saying, you know what? Okay. I am here for a purpose. I have a reason. This is my story. This is me. And so we're helping him try to embrace this instead of, trying to keep ignoring what is reality. I, you know, and that brings up a, a good point because I, I think, you know, many of us don't realize this, you know, well into adulthood and sometimes it even takes longer than, you know, just the an entry to adulthood, but it's realizing that everyone has different skills, abilities, and personality traits. And, you know, it's, he, he probably is a lot stronger in other areas that other people are incredibly weak in. And it's because of, you know, he's probably far more compassionate and, you know, just because of the things that he's been, he's had to deal with. And so, you know, he's probably much more mature just 
it, you know, there's a lot of things that we go through as patients and, uh, you know, it takes a lot of other people sometimes much longer to get to those points. So, you know, it, 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 I know for a teenager that doesn't help fix the problem, but it also, it just realizing that everyone is, it's so different, even as an adult, um, I have to, his, his outlook is amazing. He's such an old soul. His can like his compassion for others and quite honestly, his threshold for pain. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It really, <laughs> what they go through every day with medications and shots. Yeah. I think that's a, probably the big one for the Cobalamin family is, is I, I know I hear a lot about that. Um, you know, especially from the caregiver perspective, when they're injecting the, the little ones, um, it's so hard because they're injecting this tiny little baby and, you know, or toddler who squiggles and worms and does not want to cooperate. And so, yeah. And so, you know, there's the, the quality of life for the child. And then also the caregiver side, because the parent feels just so guilty having to do this to their child as you, you know, you, you feel that same kind of angst and, you know, you, you feel bad inflicting a low protein diet. You want to feed your child everything like everyone else, but you also know that it's causing damage. And it's, it's hard to be the bad guy as a parent when you're, you know, enforcing the treatment. Um, and so it's, it's the quality of life is so beyond just the patients. Um, it's also the, the poor caregivers who have to institute and, <laughs> and follow it through. Um, Pam, do you want to quickly, uh, is there anything with the mental and social health that we didn't, um, Sorry. Yeah. Um, for myself, I, I'm kind of in a little bit of a different situation because, uh, I wasn't diagnosed until so late. So all my formative years, I never knew really what my disorder was or what I had. Uh, I had always been told, told that I had Marfan syndrome because of the dislocation in my, of my lenses. And, um, at the time, when I was first growing up, homocystinuria, nobody even knew about homocystinuria. So um, I skipped a lot of the traumatic things, I guess, that probably Danae and Carson, uh, you know, are experienced and have experienced because um, I never, you know, I never really knew the problems that I had. Uh, but, and so I was eating regular food, even though I never should have been. <laughs> Uh, you know, I was able to go to stay at people's houses. I was able to go out to dinner with my friends as I got older and eat what I wanted. So I never really had the experience of, um, of dealing with the social aspect as far as that goes. But after I was diagnosed, all of a sudden, the social aspect became huge <laughs> because all of a sudden, and I've always been very open with my disability and I really don't. I don't really have any cause to hide it. I, you know, I, I, and as Danae said, you know, when you, if you do decide to go out to dinner with some friends or something, or you get invited to someone's house for dinner, and then, you know, automatically you have to explain, well, you know, we'd love to come, but, you know, don't worry about food for me. I'll just have to come up with something to bring on my own because you can't do what everybody else is doing. And uh, I have a little swim group that I'm involved in now. And about once a month, we go out to, to lunch. And the people I, I go out to lunch with, they've been great. And they've been really nice. And they always, you know, try to plan a place that we can go to that I can enjoy something too. And also, as Danae said, with family gatherings, it's a very similar situation too. You know, my family are huge foodies. I mean, food is the core of everything. <laughs> and, you know, they've been used to eating really nice gourmet meals and food. And then now all of a sudden, um, you know, we have a family gathering and they all want to have their regular gourmet family foods. And, and then I have to always plan something different for myself. And um, it, it's hard. I mean, even as an adult who I can understand the reason why we need to follow the diet. And I've had some dangerous and scary experiences having a stroke and stuff. And I can understand the rationale why I have to do it. But I still feel like, you know, it isn't really what I would like to be doing, but I know it's something that I do have to do. Yeah. I know that's the, that's the hard thing is 
I was oddly having a conversation with my three-year-old about this, you know, <laughs> adults have to do things that they don't like to do. <laughs> do. Yeah. And, you know, those, they're still hard choices, even as adults, even though they're the things that we have to do, um, mm-hmm. because it means, you know, being able to be healthy and to be here and do the other things that we, we really want to do. Um, cause it doesn't, you know, stop short of, you know, just the only thing I want to do is eat. There's, I want to be able to work and I want to be able to, <laughs> you know, hang out with my family and you got to keep yourself healthy for those things. Um, I know we're running a little bit behind schedule here, so we're going to jump to financial impact. Um, cause I think it's really important to have this discussion. Um, and I think in the rare disease community, it, it's starting to come up more often because when we think about disease, we typically think about the health in, in impact. Um, you know, rarely do we think about mental and social impact, but we really don't talk, I think, frequently enough about the financial impact. Um, and the Every Life Foundation, um, they were part of a study, I think it was last year, you know, it's in the past couple of years though, about the financial burden. Um, and it, it has a catastrophic effect on not just families, but on government. Um, and, you know, the later patients are diagnosed, the bigger the impact it is too. Um, and so it, it trickles down everywhere. Um, but one of the important things I, I, I know from the classical HCU side is, you know, we have this push for the Medical Nutrition Equity Act um, because so many patients don't actually have access to the medical formula um, or low protein formula, as some will call it, or shakes. It's got a lot of different words for the same thing, um, but it's, just, it's our essential nutrients. Um, it replaces the protein in a safe form. Um, and then the uh, low protein medical food. And a lot of times insurance doesn't cover it. Um, and I know for myself, I'm very lucky. I live in a state where the medical formula is covered for all newborn screening conditions. And when I contemplated moving, I had to factor that in. And despite the fact that Illinois is one of the most expensive states to live in, when you factor in the cost of formula, which when I tabulated it, like if it had to pay every single cent out of in, out of pocket, it would be twenty four thousand dollars. And no patient, no caregiver has twenty four thousand dollars. And even if insurance covered eighty percent, that's still a lot of money to have to come up with. Um, so ultimately, you know, it's just still cheaper to say living here in Illinois, um, <laughs> where where my formula is covered. Um, and so, but a lot of families don't have that luxury. They don't have the luxury of a state or insurance that covers their formula. And so they're stuck choosing between, you know, do I pay this bill or pay for my formula? Do I pay for my formula or do I pay for my lab work? You know, there's a lot of different things that I think families are having to choose between um, to ensure that their, fam- their children or themselves, if they're adult patients, are are getting the proper treatment, um, and it's it's a huge burden. It's a huge burden. I know for myself in college, I couldn't afford it, and that's what led to my blood clot, because um, college students don't have money for healthy diets to begin with. That's why they live on ramen, and um, and you can't live on ramen when you have homocysteinuria. So um, <laughs> it's. It's, it's really unfortunate that, you know, the quality of life is so heavily impacted um, and the financial burden is just so unreasonable when it comes to being able to afford the medically prescribed low protein diet. Um, Dana or Pamela, are there ways that the financial impact um, had, you know, that that you can speak to for yourselves or, you know, for Dana, for the Kobalamin community that you think are important? I think for the Kobalamin community, it's very scary because a lot of ours are on the orphan drug list. So we're also fighting that as well, as well as the fact that the out-of-pocket expense for things that are doing, that we have to have done at a compound at the pharmacy. And it's just, it's varying, like you said, by from state to state and country by country. We're seeing those like, get what we get and some 
it's just so varied. That's why I'm so thrilled about this because I think this is going to be a real insight to gather how this is happening from a state by state basis on what we're each dealing with because we're all doing it differently. Even another CVLG patient is not up against the same things we're up against. She's up against different things. So the fact that it's varying so much on a case by case basis, I think that's what's very scary. Uh, and the out-of-pocket expenses are out, they're astronomical. They really are. And every time we go in for a lab, as where we're at with Carson now, his numbers are going in a direction that we were not trending in the, his early years. And as they're continuing to go in the direction that we're not, that are not favorable, um, the doctors are like, it just must be adolescence. We don't know why. There's nowhere to compare him to. And in order to do that, it's a trial and error treatment with the Kabbalah kids. It's a little bit of this and let's try a little bit of that. But on some levels, we're on the highest dosage and he's been on this dosage for years. And that was when he weighed 50 pounds and now he weighs 150 pounds. And the dosage is still the same based on the medication. So the need for research, met new medications, new treatments, new therapies, it's, it's, it's so important because right now we're just, we're going based off of things that are not working. And just to say that we're, the kids are growing up is, is that's where I just can't sleep at night because there's got to be some other, some other alternatives for these kiddos. And as far as the medical goes, the, I love the fact that there's more of us because they, they do tap you as you're rare. You're one of one or two of two or 10 of 25. And that's, that's not a big enough pool for them to be able to take a chance on you or cover you. Yeah, I think that's the the one thing I get really excited about with Rarex is not just looking at like classical homocysteine or cobalamin G. You can look at those things individually, but you can also look at them as a whole as homocysteine Um, And I think that you know when we're thinking about the future and developing new therapies. Uh, and really understanding how homocystinary affects our bodies and systems. I think we need to kind of zoom out towards the, the whole landscape here and really be able to take a look. And that's what this data collection program helps um, us do. Um, Pamela, we're about to wrap up, but do you have anything that you would like to add that you know we didn't touch on? Well, I just I'll just add just a few things on the financial end of things, and I won't elaborate in any great de- great detail because I know that you and and um, Dana have also basically covered a lot of the bases. But um, in the state of Nevada, where I live, uh, the formula that we need to take is mandated by state law, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the insurances are going to see it that way (laughs) because I had many, many instances over the last 10 years that uh, my insurance company has paid for it for a short time. And then they would say, oh, well, we, we're just not going to pay for it anymore. You know, they would always, we have a limit in our, our statutes for the medical foods, like the pastas and breads and that kind of thing. And that's a limit of $2,500. So once I would um, put in my claims for my formula, they would say, oh, well, you've met the $2,500 and that's all we're going to pay. Well, there's a separate statute that really is for the formula alone. And it was back and forth, back and forth with the insurance companies constantly. And so my husband, uh, who was who is retired now, but he was an attorney and he worked for the Nevada State Legislature and he did bill drafting for them. So he decided that he was just going to take them on and um, he wrote uh, new bill drafts and presented it to the legislature and was able to uh, refine the laws that were on the statutes and on the books. And um, so then uh, he presented it to our insurance company and they had no no recourse except to pay for it. And I'm sure they're really looking forward to the fact that I'll be uh, 65 in July and will no longer be on their insurance <laughs> because they're probably tired of hearing us 
fight them, but uh, that was a real victory for us was, you know, and it wasn't just for myself, but it was for other patients with metabolic diseases too. You know, all of a sudden there were now new laws in the last year on the books saying, you know, that you have to pay for this and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So that was a, a big victory. And I, I thank, I thank the good Lord for, you know, having the husband that I did that was willing to advocate for me and, and go to bat for me. So, um, and then with the, the cystidine or the betaine that I'm on too, I mean, even with insurance, you know, I was paying 350 bucks a month <laughs> just to, to get that, that uh, formula or that uh, medicine that I needed every month. So it, it is a big impact. And also, um, you know, when, when I was diagnosed, we were pretty close to the time when we were thinking about retiring. So we really weren't saving up money because of knowing about this rare disease that I had. So, you know, that's, that, finan that impacts our financial ability now a little bit. I mean, we're, we're still very lucky to be able to do what we, we do, but, you know, the financial end of the things that I have to pay for now, um, you know, it's not what we were expecting originally, so. Yeah, I think that's, a, a, you know, a, a really good point is because if you, when you're diagnosed so much later, you you don't anticipate all those additional healthcare mm -hmm. costs, um, and I, I know it's it's one of my fears actually. <laughs> if I if I get so lucky to to be here, then um, which I have all anticipation of being here at, in my sixties and seventies, uh, <laughs> going to continue to do what I have to. Um, but it it is really scary about you know because I look at my own grandparents who are in their late eighties and what their healthcare is and they're quote unquote, healthy individuals. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, what is that going to look like for individuals with home cystinuria at that age? You know, because our healthcare system is definitely not designed for aging metabolic patients because 30 years ago, they didn't exist. So, you know, it's, it's kind of terrifying to think. So, you know, here I am in my thirties thinking about what it's going to look like in 60, trying to plan out retirement. I'm like, save, 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 but also trying to you know, be able to afford, you know, the healthcare costs that exist now too. It's, it's definitely a lot to balance. Um, it's so but, overwhelming. That's one thing that I think we all can at least relate to the fact that it is so overwhelming. And where do you begin? Where, where's the priority for that day? And that's kind of what I have to say to Carson. And I say to myself, mm -hmm. get up. Okay. Am I going to spend three hours on the phone today on hold and check that off? And then exactly. all the doctors, I mean, it's just about prioritizing, you know, how we're going to navigate this. Yes, I completely agree. Um, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's so much. Well, I wanted to end with our last share, like we do um, in the past. And so I'm going to quickly, oh boy, never can tell which screen is what. Um, so my last ask is and share is, so right now we have 18 participants enrolled um, as we shared earlier in the data collection program. I'm sorry, this is not the, the original picture I anticipated to share, um, but the program crashed. So uh, I do, we do have 18 patients now enrolled in the data collection program, and we are hoping still to have 50 by May 8th, which is quickly, quickly approaching. That's five days away. So if you've been on the fence about um, participating or you've been meaning to register, and we, we really need you to take action now. We need you to go in and create an account. Um, it's really simple process. Uh, and the two surveys we're really trying to get families to complete are the health and development survey, because that will unlock other surveys. And it gives us an idea of all the different areas of your body that have been affected. And it's not, even if you're not positive, it's homocystinary related, still check them off because who knows, maybe it could be. Um, and then the other one is the quality of life survey, as we have discussed quality of life today. Um, and so please, please, please go in, create your account, um, get those two surveys completed. It really only should take maybe 20 minutes of your time um, to complete those. They go by really quick because you know, you know yourself well enough. It's not a math test where you have to like sit there and kind of scratch your head. Um, 
to be pretty straightforward. Um, and if you have any questions, just let us know, but we really are hoping to be able to, to fill up our little map here of our uh, 50 little blue men. So um, we would like you to go blue and help us go blue for HCO. So um, yes, you can register at uh, homeassistantaria.rare-x.org. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for participating today and um, for joining in. And we hope you'll join us for our next one. Mm -hmm. All right, we are done live streaming.